Okay, good afternoon. It's quite weird sitting down. Um, uh, my name's Finnegan. Um, I work for uh, a geophysics company in the UK called GSB. Um, and I also uh, do a PhD at the University of Bradford. Um, so if I start briefly with who GSB are and who the University of Bradford are. So uh, GSB, uh, as far as I'm aware, they're the oldest uh, geophysics contractor, uh, definitely in the UK, I think possibly largely in the world. Um, they've been operating since 1986. Uh, they were recently taken over by a, a big utilities company, um, which meant we were sort of semi-merged in with the second biggest contractor in the UK, Stratascan. So uh, now combined, we're by far and away the biggest. Um, some numbers up on the screen. Uh, I think we've got a, a combined archive of around 6,000 projects. Um, and that's probably more than 100,000 hectares of geophysics data. Uh, but the key thing to come out of this bit is that 95, maybe considerably more than 95% of that is all development led. Uh, it's paid for by house builders, road builders, wind turbine builders. Um, and there's a little bit of a uncertainty about who that data now belongs to. Um, so I joined GSB uh, just as they were taken over. Um, and then recently we started to go, well, we need to find a way of dealing with these 6,000 projects that, well, we'll come to in a bit, but aren't really available anywhere. Um, we wanted to find a way of getting some of the really old data sets and reports um, available for other people. Uh, we wanted to be able to reuse data we collected 30 years ago uh, in projects we're doing now, which are happen to be next door, you know, widening motorways or stuff like that. Um, develop training sets for, for our own kind of machine learning systems so we can start to automate some of our feature picking and things like that. Um, and also a little bit of our own kind of self-congratulation, the kind of, we're, we're not only the biggest geophysics contractor, but we've also got a much bigger archive than everyone else, so you should, you should come to us. Um, whether this will work or not, I don't know. No, maybe not. Um, so, one of the problems, the biggest problems we have uh, is similar to the quote I was going to show from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, uh, in that all of our archive is, well, it's kind of on these shelves, or it's in these boxes hidden above all these shelves. Some of it might be on these CDs in boxes underneath these shelves. And if we want to know anything about these projects, I'm just going to hope that my supervisor and my director don't see this. Um, but essentially, we have to ask the people who were around in 1986 um, whether they think there was anything in some of these reports. Um, and generally, they only really know whether where they stayed was any good or whether there was good beer nearby. Um, I mean, that's not to say that all of our data is only available in those shelves. Uh, some of it is available online. I went and did a search on the uh, Heritage Gateway, which is uh, Historic England's kind of online database of everything that's busted with the historic environment records in the UK. And I was quite excited. It came back with 9,702 results. And then I put them on a map. I went, can you see on these? Uh, yeah, you can just about see that there's a couple of projects in the north of England. And then there's a lot around Exmoor. And I went and looked through the list of all the projects. And most of the HERs have come back with nothing at all. Uh, and then Exmoor has 9,213 results. I'm not quite sure how Exmoor has 9,213 results, which matches GSB Perspection. We haven't done 9,000 projects in Exmoor. Um, but evidently, GSB Perspection has been linked to a lot of the records that are inside the HER. Um, GSB also did all of the geophys for Time Team. And at least 10 of those series reports have been made available online, not by us, but by Wessex Archaeology, who actually did all the digging. Our report is just stuck at the back of their PDF report. So, some of our data is available there. And some of our data is on the ADX Grey Literature Library. But a kind of disappointingly small amount. I'm not entirely sure what happened between 2010 and 2012. 
either we did no work at all or uh, we just gave up on putting data in the ADS. I don't know. I wasn't there. I can't be blamed. Um, so what should be available online? Well, I took a bit of information from uh, the English Territories, which is now Historic England, um, their guidance on geophysical survey. Um, and they, they essentially say that all of our reports should be lodged with HDRs. Uh, some of that data should be given to ADS in terms of the uh, OASIS system. And all of our data must be archived sensibly. It doesn't say where it has to be archived, but it does say there has to be an archive made of it. So I went and had another look and thought I'd see if, if we were the only contractor who was failing to make all our data available online. Um, so this is uh, searching on the ADS for just geophysics uh, in green. Uh, yeah, there's, some years there's 100 projects. There's definitely a lot more than 100 projects which are done every year. Um, and in blue is the English Heritage Geophysical Surveys database, um, which was sort of the precursor to this OASIS database. Uh, and you can see it sort of tails off. 1995, there were quite a lot of reports. They were probably all GSB, but I haven't been able to get into this database to find out. Um, so I thought I'd take four of the big UK contractors and have a look and see if they, if we were doing terribly compared to them. And no, I think we're, we're broadly similar. Uh, North Hans put a lot of data online recently, but it's still, it's not orders of magnitude more than we're making available. Uh, and we, we do similar number of surveys a year. So comes back to, if we go back to this slide before, you see in green there's a company called Archiphysica. This isn't to single out Archiphysica, this isn't, but uh, Archiphysica only have any data available from one year. I was a bit intrigued as to why for one year they suddenly made loads of data sets available. Uh, so I went, had a look, uh, and they're all essentially this one project in one HER area. So they were being told to deposit that data by, I'm assuming, Cornwall County Council. But that's not just Archiphysica. This is a, this is a poster I saw out uh, in the post sessions by uh, Victoria Donnelly. Uh, and she had a map of all of the Grey Literature Library, uh, or at least, I think, uh, at least a, a decent subset of the Great Literature Library. And you can see there's a massive geographic bias um, to where, where reports are being lodged uh, with, the, with the ABS Great Literature Library. So we're not doing very well at the moment. What can we do to do better? So we've already done all the first bit. We've, we've, impro we've definitely improved all our archive going forward. Quite a lot of the HERs now require us to deposit raw geophysics data, raw reports, process geophysics data directly with the ADS. Um, and that's fine. So we, we now make all of our data in that format so we can be deposited with them easily. Um, but there is a cost involved with that. And we, we can't bear that cost. And we're also not able to insist that all the data <coughs> goes to ADS. Um, we can only recommend to clients that they should pay, should pay us to pay ADS to take the data. Um, but more importantly, what can we do going back those 30 years, those 6,000 projects, how can we, how can we do anything with them? So that's what uh, the rest of my, uh, my talk is about. So we need to find a better way of cataloging our, our historic data. We need to find a way of disseminating our historic data. And we need to find a way of incorporating our historic data into our current analysis. Yeah, problems with dissemination of copyright, and it is a massive undertaking. Some people just said, well, it's easy. If you've got 6,000 reports, just make a PDF of them, send them all off to the ADS. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, it doesn't quite work like that. So uh, there's a graph of uh, what, we, what we calculated the ADS cost to be for our current data collection. Um, and it's about 5 to 10% of our average data acquisition cost. So the amount that we charge to our clients, uh, we would have to spend approximately 10% of that to deposit with the ADS. Now, that's not bad, but we haven't done that for the past 30 years. Um, so we, we have to pay 400,000 
pounds if we were to go back and launch all of our historic data with ADS. Uh, and that's, well, it's not money we have sat around just doing nothing. Uh, but more importantly, the ADS, well, they don't want our boxes of reports. Um, they'll only accept archivable data quite reasonably. Um, so I thought we had to think about how we were actually going to, if we ignore the fact that we can't afford to deposit with ADS for the time being, can we at least think about how we can make archivable data that maybe further down the line we can either afford to or, yeah, we can find some way of getting around that further down the line. Um, but this is, this is also quite problematic. So this is some of, some of the oldest kit we found uh, in our office. Um, and the problem with this is, oh, that's, yeah. So uh, this, is, uh, this is what all of our old reports were printed on, uh, printed out in the field. They should be square 20 meter grids. That printer doesn't print square 20 meter grids, which causes even more complications. Um, so this is, uh, this is an advertisement for it from uh, the mid 80s. This system is on display in the National Media Museum in its history of online, uh, history, of, history of the internet, um, which gives you an idea of just how old some of this stuff is. More disappointingly, it's also displayed next to an N64 with GoldenEye, which is a bit depressing because most of them are now getting quite old. But uh, so how do we resolve some of those issues? So we have to start by salvaging the data that's on the five and a half inch floppies and stuff to long-term storage. We have to think about how we can convert some of our older data formats to more modern open file formats. We need to compile a searchable map of those sites that we can find the sites that we actually worked on. Um, some of these projects from 20 years ago might not have been built on. We need to assess the sensitivity of, of that data because we don't, we don't actually know if it really belongs to us or belongs to the people who paid for us to collect that data. No one thought about that at the time. And we don't have it in any, any of our contracts anymore, saying whether, whether we own the data or they own the data. Um, we have to consult with old clients, new clients, etc., on how, we, uh, how we're actually going to disseminate any of that data, whether we're allowed to disseminate any of that data, or whether we're only allowed to, subset, to disseminate a subset. Uh, and finally, we need to find a way of just actually disseminating it to me. So, salvaging data. So we, st we at least made a start on salvaging some of our really early data sets. If I shoot back to that. So this, is, this was a plot of a, a, a very nice old geophysics data set, dot density plot. Doesn't actually have two certain features in. One of them is just a coffee stain. Um, but this is the only copy of this data we have. We don't have a digital copy. We don't have, yeah, we only have a coffee stained dot density plot. Some of it might have been hand, hand drawn. But if we can, we can start to think about, at least if we can take these dot density plots which have a known plotting range, we can convert them, we can scan them, we can pass them through some Python programs, uh, we can convert them back to a normal grayscale image, but more importantly, we can convert them back to a number, an, a number of nanoteslas that we can then store uh, if we want to do any more post-processing, post we can, or we have it in a digital format that we can deal with going down the line. Um, converting data to more archival formats. This is, this is largely okay. These are taken from the, the ADS. This is the, the kind of data that the ADS wants, uh, the data formats. So they want our CAD drawings to be in things like DXFs. Uh, they want all of our geophysics data to be available in ASCII text, which is entirely reasonable. No, so, no geophysics software really makes data in ASCII text, but uh, we can, we can write software that converts that, but we still have to, to deal with that backlog of data that's only available in odd binary formats. So we thought about how we're going to deal with our actual data, getting either dot densities or grayscales into numbers that we can then pass on. But some of these sites might be very difficult to actually locate. So this is a... Uh, this is an example. Uh, the one on the on the left is a is the front cover of a, one of our more modern reports, and the one on the right is the oldest report I could find in the ADS Grey Literature Library. So it's um, from 1990. Um, 
it's what the the dot density plot that was shown on the earlier plot is from. But the only description of the data is that it's M3 bar end Compton Winchester bypass. Okay. <laughs> All right. It doesn't have any national grid information, and that text isn't that useful. More helpfully, the one on the left, our more modern report, does at least have a national grid reference that we can use to map onto a map. Use to map. So we can, all of our modern reports that we have a national grid reference for, we can display, we can put a pin on a map and show well, that report is definitely there. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite work that well either. If we, if we look down here, I don't know if you can see the cursor, you see that there's a, there's a pin in the middle of the sea that that's, a, that's supposed to be in Norton Fitzwarren, which is definitely not in the middle of the sea. Um, and there are other errors elsewhere in that data set. Um, generally just transposed uh, numbers or letters in the national grid reference. But if they're the only location information we have for some of these data sets, what else are we going to do? Well, we could have a look at using Big Maps or Google Maps is a geo, uh, geo search APIs. Uh, and we can pass the text strings, say, Winchester Compton Bypass or stuff like that, um, which I've done. Uh, and you can play a little, get a little bit of a game of spot the difference on this. Uh, these maps, both Bing and Google, were sent exactly the same text strings. Um, and you can see that quite a lot of those points are in very different positions. So there are issues in, uh, with uh, geocoding text just as much as there are issues with errors in national grid references. Um, OK, so we, we still need to do a bit of work on the on locating sites, but we can get most of them in, in round about the right place. But what about if we actually want to locate data? That, that's a bit harder. I mean, a, a site could be a, a one hectare field. It could be a 10 kilometer road corridor. It could be a, a massive housing development. Um, some of this data. Yeah, it's, if we just have a pin on the map, we don't know whereabouts around that pin it actually is. Um, so yeah, so we can we can look at uh, we can look at batch extraction of uh, data from our CAD files, um, but even then, that gets a little bit problematic. So this is a uh, this is taken from uh, DXF Grabber, which is a Python library for grabbing data out of DXF. Um, all of our images are geo-reference images, and unfortunately, I've yet to find any uh, open source software which can extract an image from a from a DXF and tell me where it where it's supposed to be. Even though we display it, in, if we open it in AutoCAD or DraftSite or any of the other uh, AutoCAD libraries, it'll display in the right place. There aren't any open libraries that seem to be able to extract that information. Uh, I have a, a manual for the, the, DXF, the DXF reference manual on my desk. It's an inch and a half thick, uh, and there's no digital version of it available. It's quite difficult to find where this information is located in the, in the DXF file. Um, <coughs> gets even more problematic is if we don't have our natively georeferenced data. So this is, again, from the M3 Compton bypass. Um, this is the extent of the georeferencing information um, available in the, the body of the report. Uh, I was having a bit of a play around last night, and I think I, I think I might have got it in the right place, but it did take me about half an hour. <laughs> Given that we have 6,000 of these sites, that's not that feasible. Um, if, you, if you can see on the Google Earth image, you see it's supposed to be curved. For some reason, they haven't displayed it in the uh, in the a uh, project is being curved, I think, probably because they couldn't print it as being curved at the time. Um, our brand new kind of two-year-old data, we can, we can deal with more easily because it's all GNS re re referenced, so we can just drop that straight into a Google Earth type file, um, which is all very nice, but that only amounts to, let's see, probably a thousand hectares of our hundred thousand hectare archive. Okay, so there are lots of problems with actually working out where the data should be. 
But uh, there are even more problems with the sensitivity of data. Quite a lot of the companies that we've done this work for no longer exist, have been taken over by other companies. Uh, and there isn't really that trail information about who, who should own this data anymore. Um, there's a kind of question about, do we want to make all this data openly available for everyone to look at? Is it, is it our job to make all that information openly available when we've just been contracted in by another company to do this survey and then it should be part of a greater archaeological uh, workflow? Um, should it be published alongside any kind of later excavation information, which we don't have, because we're, we're only the very first part of this project? And who do we consult? before this information is available. Um, and the final bit is, should we, should we make this available based on different data tiers? So should we make all the data available to everyone or only a small set of information available to everyone? So I think internally we've, we've sort of settled on a, on a four tier option. And I'd quite like feedback um, from people on whether they think this is a, a suitable approach or or the worst idea we've ever had. So uh, if we go through the tiers, so tier one would just be a pin on the map with a project number and name. So <coughs> then you can contact us, you can ask for a copy of that report. That's fine. So that's, that's fairly, I mean, we're already there. That's easy. Uh, tier two might be a pin on the map with a summary from the report. So yeah, we found some archaeology on this site. Still, if you actually want to look at the data, look at the interpretation, you still got to contact us. Tier three might be access to unlocated data plots, but this causes its own problems because the image on the left uh, is, is the data that's been collected. If you've already got a pin on the map that shows you vaguely where that data is, it's quite easy to do a bit of a jigsaw puzzle and go, oh, that's, oh, that's clearly that field, that's fine. Or well, finally, tier four, access to the full data, located report, available on map, nice and easy. Um, so yeah, so does anyone have any, any answers to any of, any of these problems? Um, dealing with 30 year old reports or disseminating information that, that is sensitive uh, even after 30 years? <laughs> 